Hello, everybody. My name's James. Welcome to another Planet FPL Clash of the Correspondents. And this week, we're looking ahead to game week 30. Now we've got that bloody blank out of the way. Firstly, let me introduce you to our Chelsea correspondent, Gary Mantle. How are you, Gary? Yeah, not too bad. Nearly got decapitated by Raheem Sterling free kick yesterday, but I've managed to survive. And here I am. <laughs> Yep, Gary, thanks for the early nod at the Monday evening pre-record. And let me introduce you to our Burnley correspondent, Jack Turner. How are you, Jack? Yep, very well, thank you. You won at the weekend. I know, pigs are flying. <laughs> Gary, tell Jack why... Uh, uh, but yeah, you, a little bit more often. Gary, tell Jack why Burnley are going to win in game week 30. I'll tell Jack and I'll tell everyone. So the last um, five times that we've played at home after this March international break, we have lost. Um, and it's not as if we're playing particularly good teams. This is, I've already, right, there we go. Let's really start ruffling some feathers early doors. Crystal Palace, Brentford, West Brom, Tottenham. And last season was Aston Villa, which was um, Potter's final game. Uh, so and for some that, reason... That, that... That's Tottenham's only win at Stamford Bridge since 1990. Yeah, that's right. That's how cursed this fixture is for us. And so, yeah, now we have another, what looks like a winnable home game against a team that won't have their striker. And let's see what happens. Jack, can you win at Stamford Bridge? I did say it would be a very us thing to probably go and do. Um, and not having Fafana, well, I don't think he's the biggest miss now of Foster's pack. So, um I, I did say after we won on Saturday, I said, watch us, we'll, we'll beat Chelsea and we'll get beat to Sheffield United. It would just be <laughs> so typical. I've got a counter stat though, Gary, to this yeah. horrendous hoodoo after the March international breaks. Do you know when you last lost a home game in March was in the Premier League? Mm, wouldn't have a clue, to be honest. No. No, I if I told you it was against Sunderland, could you guess the year? Well, we lost at home to Sunderland, but not in March, in Mourinho's second year of his... No. The year that he didn't win the title. The first year of his second spell. That wasn't in March, though. No. That would have been um, 2014. Um, no. No. But even then, which one was it? It's not the 3-0, surely. The answer... He's 2001. Wow. And unfortunately for Jack, although it does fall off the other end of the March international break, the game does still fall into March, Gary. I think that's what's the difference one is here. So so actually, what's this going to be now then? Is this straightforward home win or is this going to be one of them Chelsea days? When did we last have a straightforward home win? Maybe Fulham, but that was 1-0. We don't really do straightforward, do we? <laughs> okay. If anyone what? watched us against Leicester, we don't do straightforward. No, I, 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 don't turned, do straightforward. I only caught the end. It was at 2-2. I thought it might be interesting. I wish I hadn't bothered, actually. So I missed the, the Sterling penalty. I have seen the Sterling free kick, which I understand caused quite a bit of booing at Stamford Bridge. Were you at the game? I was at the game, yeah. Were, were the crowd singing, you don't know what you're doing, when Pochettino took off Mudrick rather than Sterling? Yes. So um, that was, yeah, um, what was a bit strange yesterday? Um, we started first half with uh, Mudrick in the 10 and Sterling out on the left. And at half time, we're absolutely cruising. We should have been 4 0 up, except Sterling had missed a penalty and missed a one on one. So we're, we're strolling through the game. For some reason, for the second half, he switched them around and he put Mudrick on the left and he put Sterling in the middle. And it didn't seem to work, and then we've they've got it back to two all. Sterling's and for those that don't know, with the penalty, obviously Palmer's our penalty taker, and Sterling, who won the penalty, has taken it upon himself to take the penalty. Palmer's gone over to get the ball, and Sterling's like, "No, I'm having this." Palmer sort of looks up to Sterling a bit. They both came through at Man City. He's the older player. He's going to pull rank, and Palmer's like just ceded it to him. So he's missed the penalty, and then we have this um, free kick that was also originally given as a penalty. Interestingly, Sterling walked off. He'd walked to the halfway line when it was given as a penalty. Then it gets given as a free kick. And Sterling comes back, tells Palmer that he's having it. And then the only reason that it didn't hit me is I sit in the upper tier, but I sit behind the goal. And it didn't go anywhere near the goal. It went well off to the side of the goal. Um, 
I don't know if that actually went in the lower or the upper, but it was it was it was terrible. It's like you'd have to see it to believe that someone could could do such a thing. So he's obviously having an absolute stinker. And we're like, they started like chanting to like get him off and like all of this, which is old school chant. I haven't heard that for a while. And then we're bringing on a sub and it's Mudrick. Is that chant repeatable? Oh, it's just get him off, get him off, get him off. It was really started, so like, like get him off, section, get him off by a section of the Matthew Harden. Wow, yeah. that's but he's not he's not popular at all anyway. And then like we've got one absolute golden boy at our club at the moment, and it's Palmer. And he's barging them out of the way to take a penalty. Then he barges them out of the way to take a free kick. And it's like, what are you doing? Um, so we all just assumed that he was going to be the one that came off. And Mudrick had played well in the first half. Um, and it wasn't. He he took Mudrick off instead of Sterling. And we were like, but we thought Mudrick was playing all right. Mudrick had done well when he came on against Newcastle. He did well when he came on against Leeds. It's like, why are you leaving Sterling on the pitch? And so the chant was, yeah, you don't know what you're doing. And... Um, it was a frustration at Sterling still being on the pitch. It was the anger was kind of at Sterling and then at Pochettino for sort of going along with it. I'm going to give Pochettino a bit of grace here because I've obviously experienced him being manager of my team, and there's enough times, Gary, I would say, plenty of times where you, you could tell a player was really struggling, and rather than take him off and have the, the potential of boost, abuse and the potential of booing, you know, that ironic cheering that probably would have happened when his number went up. Rather than that, he's protected the player by leaving him on. That's been his solution. I've seen him do it so many times. So it doesn't right. surprise me. I think that's why he's done it. He's almost okay, like, but... the reaction is going to be really bad. I'll leave him on. Yeah, he did. And then about 10 or 15 minutes later, he took him off. So what happened when he did take him off was... People started doing the ironic cheer and people started booing. And then it did turn into applause. It was as if more of the fans in the ground felt sorry for him for getting the the boos and like the, the abuse than were willing to do the booing and the abusing. So for me personally, um, I did boo him when he put that free kick high and wide and everything because I was annoyed at him because he'd done it again where he's taken it off Palmer. And I'm 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 quite like not happy with him in general because I, I don't think he looks like he's particularly wanting to play for Chelsea at the moment. His big concern at the moment is he wants to get back in the Euro squad. And no we can all sit here and go, he's not going to do it. Of course yeah. he's not. But if you were him in that position, you're still going to give it everything. And what happens if Marcus Rashford gets injured and Bukayo Saka gets injured and probably about 10 other players get injured? <laughs> but he, he still thinks he's got a chance and he's... I'd be checking Wilson Odebert's birth certificate, personally. (laughs) Mate, and I agree, I agree. And like Southgate probably agrees, but he's like trying to do it, do everything for himself. But that's the point, it's for himself. I'm not a Raheem Sterling supporter, I'm a Chelsea supporter. I want what's best for the club. He'd have been been the oldest player in that team. He'd have been the oldest player in that team, wouldn't he? Yeah, by now. He's, he's, I say, Kukurea's next and Chilwell when he came on. And they're the only two that are like, sort of at what should be their peak. What's Sterling's, the, Sterling's past his peak, if we're, if we're honest. What's what's the relationship between the fans and the, the manager at the moment? Is there one? No. Um, there's, so he's never, ever had his name sung. Not once. We've not, we've not come up with a positive... He has had his name sung. Um, he had unrepeatable words before it, and that was at <laughs> Brentford. Um, we've never had a positive song towards Pochettino um, but it's it's still pretty split I talk to as many fans who are more on the Pochettino in camp as I do that are in the Pochettino out camp and personally I'm in the in camp what I did notice with him is that so at the end of the game we we quite often do a, a lap of honour um, but he doesn't join in so he never comes over to the fans at the end of the game and I don't mind that because he doesn't do it when we've won and he doesn't do it when we've lost. But well, he's consistent then, that's right. That's right, exactly. Whereas I did notice with Frank Lampard that he used to come over when we'd won and he'd go down the tunnel when we'd lost. Um, and Pochettino is more like he's staying away. He's like, this, like give the players your praise, give the players your support and everything like that. He's like, I don't need it. Yeah, can, I, 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 get, I, I, I think it. only away games he would do it with us. He wouldn't do it with home games. I'd... Very rarely saw him come on the pitch for a home game. Away games, he used to at the end. 
if we'd won, but not in home yeah. games. Yeah. Well, you see, the only away game I've been to that we've won is Tottenham. And that was a bit different because. Yeah, you weren't going to go shine off that night. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Exactly. So, to be honest, I don't know that for sure. I'd have to actually go to an away game and we'd have to actually win that away game. And that's too low of a probability for me to find out. You mentioned there was some unsavoury songs at Brentford, but there were also to the, the owners at that same game as well, right? Well, certainly so at least think, to Todd Bolly. Yeah, and who is the sort of face of the ownership, despite not being the majority owner, in the same way that the, the, the way it goes at Tottenham is that the chance are against Daniel Levy, but he's not the owner of the football club and everything like that. He's sort of the one that's, that's uh, sort of front and centre, and that's what Todd Bolly is. And I think most of us would I, d- I don't know now but I think most of us would put more blame with them than they would with Pochettino I certainly would um, it's I, I, I've started to try and be a little bit more objective about about what's going on because obviously we had the Carabao final that we should have won and we failed to take our chances and we should have won it in normal time and we assumed yeah, that we everyone's forgotten that because like of extra time mate yeah exactly this is it we assumed that we were just going to carry on in the same way an extra time, and then we didn't. And then, obviously, what happened happened. Um, and then everybody was saying, "Well, it's about like to talk about the transfer fees and all of this." And I started looking into the experience of this squad, and now I realise how sort of naive I was pre-season to think that we might actually come top four with this squad, um, based on their experience levels. So. The players that I've, that I've looked at that I'd highlight, Colwell, Gusto, Caicedo, Palmer, uh, Madueke, Jackson, Mudrick. All of them have played fewer than 100 senior football matches at the start of this season. Cole Palmer's still well under 100. These guys are really, really inexperienced. They've not played men's football and we put them all in together and they're all supposed to grow together but they don't have the players to learn off but the players are supposed to learn off of people like Sterling who's apparently he's actually quite a good influence on them according to uh, Carney Chokramaker and uh, Christopher Nkunku who's injured and you think we knew that we were going to have some setbacks but I don't think I quite appreciated that our starting level is sort of sixth or seventh and we're going to have setbacks which is going to put us where we are now but the reality is we'll be ch- we should be challenging for seventh. And that's probably about right for this squad. I think the, and the problem is that the, next the players, season, the, the players the you mentioned is going to be the top is, four season. It's, it's not, not going to be the top four season. It's, uh, it's, what you mentioned there in terms of the inexperience, in terms of actual appearance and stuff, is absolutely right. You know what the neutral will say. And also within that, you mentioned one player who's obviously a complete outlier in Palmer. He's not phased and yeah. not bothered. No, and I realise no. he transitioned within the same country, whereas a lot of those have, have moved from outside and have to adjust and stuff. Jack, just yeah. to get your neutral opinion on on Chelsea and how do you view them? A lot of people on the outside just think it's a basket case at the moment. Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, it's very hard. It just seems like you've thrown good money over bad. And, you know, it, I always find it's very hard when you, you hear people being so critical of, of, the, of the board. It's like if they're spending money, there's clearly they clearly want you to to succeed and i think you know they wouldn't spend that money if if they if they weren't trying to run it as a business to make more money you know, ultimately the more the more successful you are the more money they they get don't they so um i think it's similar to us though i think if you if you merge that many young players together without some experience it's it's very hard to to have immediate success and i think the pressure at chelsea it it's not going to create a good atmosphere is it it's just it's only going to go one way um, you you need to for me. I think you need to have a balance of you know some good solid Premier League players that have that are experienced, and then sort of mould the the younger ones around that. Um, and that's the same with us, really. What what, what we've done exactly the same this season. Same time, Gary. Though you shouldn't be eleventh, should you? But no, we shouldn't be eleventh. But we are in that sort of fighting for seventh sort of thing. I think we're four points off seventh, something like that. Uh, I mean, to be honest, when I, when I look at the next four fixtures that you've got, this is probably where you should be at, at the end of it. To, uh, maybe subject to your result against Manchester United, there's a real opportunity over these next four fixtures. Yeah, um, we should, and we've still got to play a couple of the teams that are above us. So Brighton's one of them, and West Ham. We've got to play them at home, and we beat Newcastle at home, which was good. And you think 
all it would have taken was for us to have like beaten walls at home and suddenly you'd be going, oh yeah, we're wherever we would be and with a game in hand kind of thing. So it's, it is quite fine margins. Um, none of us want to be 11th, obviously. Um, it does look and sound worse than it is, in my opinion. Um, and it will just depend on what we manage to do between now and the end of the season. Uh, something that I think is very positive that Pochettino has done is that we do seem to have quite a good team spirit. These players actually do seem to get on well and they do seem to want to play for him, uh, which isn't always the, easy to do at Chelsea. They were not the only ones. Manchester United have had the same problem where sometimes, you know, different factions go off and they're against the manager and all that. We haven't had that this season. So that's, that is um, quite positive. They They seem to want to play for him, I think, the general trend this season has been upwards. We had a really bad start after six games. Um, and like our games four to six were Forest failed to score and lost. Bournemouth failed to score and drew. Villa failed to score and lost. Like, like two defeats are at home as well. And you're like, am I just going to be watching the same thing as last season? Now, one of two things has happened. Either Pochettino has managed to like sort it out and um, get us going, which I do think has happened. But also Cole Palmer started playing for our first team. And maybe the whole difference now between what we had last season and this season is that we've got Cole, Cole Palmer. Palmer season, game week we seven after season. that run of three games without well, scoring, wasn't it? Fulham been, away. Fulham away was his first game. That's yeah. right. Yeah, because I'd seen him in the Carabao before and I was like, this guy looks good. And then, but you never know how it's going to go into league football. And his actual breakthrough game was Burnley away. Where it's like, okay, this guy's got time and he's going to take the penalties. We'll come back on to Palmer. Jack, keen to talk about Vincent Company as well. Is he lucky to still have the job? I think so. I think I think we sort of talked about it earlier in the season where he had a lot in the bank from, from last season's campaign because last season was one of the best I've seen um, you know, in, in my lifetime watching us. So I think so. I think as well with him being a household name helps. You know, it's not just, you know, some some random guy, it's Vincent Company. You know, we've become Vincent Company's Burnley, so to speak. Still Vincent um, Company first managerial job, though, isn't it? Well, he was uh, he was in um, Anderlecht, wasn't he, in, in Belgium for, yes. for a little while. Um, first proper, you know, you, you could argue, you know, big job. Um, I, I'd have I'd have been open to, to for him leaving, sort of, if it was the back end of last year or, you know, sort of January time. But I think we've obviously held on now. It's, you know, it would, it would make absolutely no sense, but yeah, I think in a way, you know, he's, he's, he's defo, you know, he defo owes us a little bit here because we've, we've put a lot of faith in him. He's got the five year contract that we gave him at the start of the year. You know, it was rumored that he was speaking with, you know, both of your clubs, you know, Chelsea and Tottenham, I believe at one point. So um, yeah, I think he's, he's got a lot to learn still. Um, I think, I think he's, learning properly on the job now. I think had he have gone to a top club, I think it probably would have masked some of the, the problems that he's he's had and you know, some of his challenges would have been completely different. Um but yeah, we've we've stuck by him, I think. You know, probably similar to what Gary was saying. There's been, you know, there's there is a bit of a divide in the fan base with us, with with, with Vincent. Um I think most people kind of do see that, you know, it's definitely part of a transition. But I mean some of the mistakes he's made this season, game week after game week, it's just, you know, it's been it's been really painful given the amount of money we've spent you know we've we've never spent the likes of what we spent this season um and to be so cut adrift and so out of pretty much most games we've we've watched us, us play it's been, been a really frustrating campaign but you also same as with Sheffield United you're not necessarily stronger than the team that come up right yeah um but but then that's it for all the money we've spent you know how can we not be any stronger than last season you know it's it's crazy to say that you know it's it's great to say we've got all these young players that that will come good, but you know actually for us to spend that amount of money, we, we can't aff- we can't necessarily afford there's to keep that, going. That, up there's parallels down. here between the two clubs. You've Absolutely. bought a lot of young players, Jack, right? Who yeah, probably same. Not not got the experience. Yeah, and, you know, and the only real ones that you'd say have come in with good England experience would be Sanderberg and Dar O'Shea. Um, I think if we'd have had three or four more of those we probably would have had a little bit more character. But I think to get rid of the the foundations of what got us up last season and completely disregard it um, has been a massive mistake. I mean, you know, there's there's players that Dice used to play that you'd say, oh, I'm not even sure they're a Premier League player, but he, he knew how to get something out of them. Um, you know, these are young, you know, sometimes 18, 19-year-old lads that have moved 
to a different country, you know, it's a lot to take in and it's a lot to expect them to hit the ground running. You know, we, we used to always see under Dice that players would be here for two or three months and they'd be introduced slowly. You know, we've we've gone and signed, you know, two more on loan in January and they start three get three days after they sign. Um, you know, they've they've adapted well under the circumstances. But I mean I I just think it's you know it's a recipe for disaster really. I think like Gary said, he was a little bit sort of optimistic at the start of the season. I think I've completely got it wrong as well. I expect, you know, there was there was real positivity and you know you was one as well that thought there was big things coming from us this season. But I think too many mistakes from company really, you know, recruitment and team selection and tactics. It's yeah, it's been a season to forget really. <laughs> Yeah, it took me a long time to even accept you wouldn't improve, Jack. I mean, it, it's only the Bournemouth game a couple of weeks ago. Again, you watch the game, you see how much of the ball you had. And it's like in between both penalty areas, you're fine. You're absolutely fine. You came to my place in the third round of cup in January and suddenly put on this really good counter-attacking defensive display and we couldn't break you down. It was yeah. one of the most diff- di- difficult games we've had this season in trying to actually create chances. And it's like every time... So once every month or so, I get a little window sign. I think there is something there, and then you have a couple of terrible results again. You think, oh no, 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 they're, they're, they're too far gone. As uh, have the Premier League thrown you another caveat today, or is this because you're only five points off, mate? Now yeah. there's forest deductions come into play. There's been more point deductions this season than we've had home wins, though. So it's like you know, it's it's, it's only going to be good enough if we can actually string some results together. And I've ripped. Yeah. It's probably a joke about Forrest taking a minus four to go rid of uh, with everyone who didn't free hit this weekend and regretted it as well, mate. They've only gone one worse than regular, haven't they? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but no, I just, I'd resign myself to the facts of saying even with point deductions, I was looking at it a few weeks ago and I thought, you know, even if you put us level on points with, with Forrest and Everton, I still think Luton are a better size than us. And I still imagine they'll pick up points between now and the end of the season. It's, it's not impossible, but I think practically... It just really isn't. Um, but it's football. It could all change. You know, if we all of a sudden pick up a shock result at the weekend and, you know, we've still got, you know, Forest to play at the end of the season. We've still got... Game week 38. Yeah. So, you know, it, it could be tight. But, I mean, I've seen reports today that say, you know, with, with Forest, they still have the right to appeal and that appeal yes. won't be done until after the season. So, you know, it'd be... We could even... We could stay up and still go down. So, you know, it's, it's just an absolute you're farce. Also, you're five points adrift. You might be in a couple of weeks less than that, even yeah. without winning games, because Everton might be in for more as well. You You'd could be all right if everyone got points deductions, but um, yeah, you, you keep dishing them out. You might eventually stay up. It does feel like though, Jack, sort of probably sort of in around the ballpark of about 30, 31, 32 might be enough. I know it's probably a big ask for you to win four when you've won four out of 29. I, I get that, but there are some winnable games left, aren't there? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But I just, I, I don't, I haven't seen anything in the previous games that, that makes me think that we can string that kind of form together. Um, stranger things have happened, but I mean, I, I, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be saying, saying it's a, a, a good, a good possibility really. I, I take it you were at Turf more on Saturday. How nervous was it at the end? Yeah, we made we made hard work of it. We huffed and puffed. I mean, you know, we we sort of touched on Fafana before, and I mean, he got in the team of the week this week. I, th- I thought he was pretty bang average again. You know, he, he had two golden chances that he, he'd scuffed. Um, but yeah, he obviously popped up with that corker last, you know, sort of last week. Um, yeah, we it was quite nervy at the end. Um, it could have quite easily gone the other way, and I'm I'm not sure it's a foul on Murich for the you know for the sort of disallowed equaliser. Um, I, I wouldn't have been surprised that on another day it went a different way. Um, I mean, it just felt like our luck was in really on on Saturday. The whole atmosphere changed with the introduction of Murich. Um, you know, the, the fans seemed to actually get behind us again. Um, there was just a couple of, you know, sort of flying tackles that got the crowd off the seat. It's just stuff that we haven't had all season. So I think that gave us a bit of momentum. But, you know, realistically, to, to play against 10 men for so long, you know, and a team like, no disrespect to Brentford, but those are you, you, your games at home where you look at and you go, we could pick points up here. So to play that long against 10 men and still be sort of hanging on in the last 10 minutes, um, yeah, not ideal. But I mean, we, we've we all been there against 10 men where sometimes it can make it harder to play. And I think they did still, they still set up quite well. Um, and obviously Thomas Frank's come out and said that had they have had 11 men, he, he reckons they'd have come to the one. And I, 
don't think I really disagree with that. But you know, okay, you're that's, not going to crystal ball, have you? So <laughs> no, 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 sure. And you, you literally never know. Eleven v eleven, you get a, a different game sometimes. Do you want to give Gary that loan update on uh, Fafana? Yeah, I mean, he's he does some things really well, and then he does some things terribly. <laughs> you know, he's just he's, he's another one. He's he's raw. He's young. Um, you know, there's definitely definitely a player in there. Um, you know, obviously we've we've passed that one across the box on Saturday. He's, you know, I don't know what his XG on it was, but it was it was harder to miss than it was to score. Uh, when I said it, it's too close for me, he only prefers them from like 25, 30 yards out. Don't worry, I've got Werner um, down there. <laughs> he just he reminds me of a poor man's Nunes. You know, it's like he does all the hard things well, but the easy stuff he just manages to cock them up, and it's like how have have you managed to do that? Um, but he's actually showed a bit of fight, and he, you know he. he he does a lot of running. He's shown a lot of fight for the shirt, so you can't really complain, really. Gary, capable for Chelsea in the future? You see him as a long-term player for the club? You never know. Like I saw him last season, and last season was an absolute disaster anyway, and he looked like he was nowhere near ready. I mean, we'd just thrown him in. He'd come from the, from the Swedish league, and he's still really young. Um, and teams are going to play a bit different against Chelsea than they are against Burnley. Like You see the goal that he scored at the weekend, teams aren't gonna have, aren't gonna be that far up the pitch at Stamford Bridge. You're not gonna get that space to to score that kind of goal. And he looked like a lot of the time he was surprised at how little time he had on the ball when he was at Chelsea. And it's like he needs he needs some experience. He needs to that's 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 not at Chelsea. He needs he needs a loan and I think he needs another loan again next season. And then we'll see from there. I think he's he's got like potential but I wouldn't say that he's ready to just come in and be a striker next season just, just while we're talking about loanies what are you making of the Breuer situation at the moment it wasn't even in the squad at the weekend four million pounds we'll take it I mean he wasn't, <laughs> we, need, he wasn't is that a, we need it or we do need it that's right he wasn't going to be in our squad he's like he doesn't look like he's up to it for Chelsea, to be honest. Um, I don't know how much of it is like the, the injuries and everything like that. And maybe he'll get it back. And maybe he's one of those that will peak a little bit later, like Dominic Solanke, who's also a former Chelsea player. But at the moment, I can't see how he gets in, into our team. So him being at Fulham and not playing, it's exactly the same. If he was at Chelsea, he wouldn't be playing just now. We got a bit of money for him. What he needs again, the problem is, is he needs a loan because he needs to get his value back up because he's probably lost more than four million in value by not playing at all in Fulham. That's, yeah, it's, ca- it's really counterproductive, mate. It's not, it's not good that yeah. he's not playing at all. It depends which year we need the money in for the books, doesn't it? So we probably <laughs> needed that money right now. So, uh, Jack, yeah. you said for Fana probably won't. He's obviously ineligible for the game in game week thirty. You said probably won't be a big miss though. I take it you think by then Foster will be ready to start. That was a. a one of Vincent Company's surprises, I suppose, that he didn't want to give away in his press conference because he never gives us any fit away. You think you go straight back in in game week thirty at Stamford Bridge, then? Yeah, I think I think for for Foster to make the bench, I think it means he's you know he, he, I don't think he would have been on the bench and made a cameo if he wasn't fit. So um, yeah, that's probably doing for Farna a bit of injustice, really. I think had Foster not have been back available, then for Farna would have been a massive miss because I think for us to play with Rodriguez up front. It's a completely different game, um, but I think you know Foster and Fofana they're a similar sort of player. So um, I think with having Foster back, it's you know it's, it's perfect timing for us really. Um, you know, and I think it's it's probably been hard for Fofana to come in in January when you know the the home atmosphere has been terrible. You know, he's coming into a struggling squad. I think I think really for him to come in and hit the ground running again, it's a, it's a massive ask. Um, had we have had Fofana from the start of the season, it might have been. We might have set up completely differently and, and tried to maybe build around him a little bit more, but um, no, I think I think it's probably a good timing for, for for Foster to be back. But you know, with with his injuries and his his other issues, you know, obviously his mental health he's had this season, I think it's been a really tough season for him. So to have both of them in for the running would be, you know, it would be a, a massive help, really. Okay, let's talk a bit of fantasy, Gary. Let's start with main man Palmer. What would you say to anybody who doesn't own him at this minute, like Muggins here? Um, that nobody's essential. But if you want, feel like I was player, speaking in a the mirror, then. But okay, go on. <laughs> you, can, no, you can still get you can you can still do all right without having Palmer, but he is just so consistent. I don't. I, I know that there was the thing at the start where everyone was like, "I was just penalties." I was like, 
I watch him every week. This guy is a fantastic footballer. He's, He's exactly super outstanding. Um, and it's quite often for us, we'll have, we'll have games like uh, Newcastle on Monday night, where it's like we've gone ahead, we're comfortable, we've stupidly let them back in it, like we do with every single game. And then it's like, right, how are we going to break the deadlock again? And it's Palmer. He's he's not phased by all of this. He'll get that space. He's he's so composed. I, I don't think I've seen a, a player at Chelsea with this level of like slowing the game down in his head and not making the pass until the pass is ready to be made. He's never rushed. If the pass isn't on, he'll just go back. He won't play a stupid pass that gives the ball away. He'll just like keep hold of the ball, uh, which is pretty rare for a player that plays in like the front three hmm. to give the ball away as little as he gives the ball away. It's just it's just the way the game works. His decision it. making is phenomenal. It's, yeah, it's, he seems it's, to it's always unreal. make the right choice. And the, the Palace away game was like the really good example of that. Where it's like you're looking up and there's a crowded area, and in his mind he can see the player that's making that run into that one bit where he can get the space, which was like Conor Gallagher and Fernandez, whatever. And yeah, it's, uh, the thing is, if you if you watch Chelsea, then you don't need me to tell you. Yeah. Because he just stands out every single match. Maybe not Man City away, but that's Man City away. But otherwise, every single match he stands out. So, so different question then. Captain for Game Week 30? You know, I hadn't even thought about it. And then people have started talking about it. And so, but why wouldn't they? Show, I mean, you've got City and Arsenal playing each other. Liverpool and to Brighton, obviously, Mo obviously appeals, but, you know. Fitness doubts, I think, still persist a little bit. You've got the Tottenham players at home to Luton, Watkins at home to Wolves. Uh, it's know, still it's not... Salah for me. It's still Salah for me. I get I, that. I don't, are there really are there that many fitness doubts now? We played 90 midweek. No, I'm over egging it because I'm trying mm. to see if you'll tell me Cole Palmer's the best captaincy in game week 30. He's got to be in contention, surely. He, he, he is in contention. Like, I, I really hadn't actually considered him. Do you think it's a psychological yeah. about that? In the sense that if he was 9 million... We'd all, it's, it's it's almost like oh he's five point seven midfielder. I don't know if we want to captain him. Do you think that psychological one it plays into our thinking a bit? I think it is, yeah. Because um, he should be about nine million next year, shouldn't he? He won't be as high as that, but he'll be a lot higher, obviously, than he is this season. We're not going to get away I with. I don't, I don't know, Gary. Got. What's he got? Twenty attacking returns since and since what but game week seven? He's nearly won a game. Nine mate. million is he? Saka's not nine mil. I think he's. He's in that bracket at the moment. He's in this sort of, which yeah. in itself 20, is like 20 attacking returns. Yeah. Um, but he's also the talisman of our team. Like, if we do well, it is because he's done well. Um, so, yeah, I, I get it. Like, it's a game that we should win. But I'm always like, thinking games that we should win doesn't mean games that we will win. But generally, we've actually been all right at home since sort of October. We had that blip against Wolves, but otherwise, we generally won most of our games at home. Is it fair to say yeah. winnable home games last year, though? What I mean is that you'd have expected to win those home games. Yeah, which is relevant to this conversation. No <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. It is. We're playing against Burnley. Um, so, yeah, it's. I think he's a perfectly valid um, captaincy shout. I'm probably still going to go with Salah because it's just Salah and... You just know what Liverpool are like. If they get going, then and he has one of his games, then it's fair. Um, and yeah, I don't know. It's just that it's the historical reliability as well, isn't it? That we know that Salah's done this year after year, and Palmer's done this for a few months, but he has done it consistently throughout those few months. Don't get me wrong. And he's in the England squad, and he deserves to be in the England squad. And even like, the neutrals are saying, you can't leave him out. In the no squad. way, this mate. Isn't just this isn't just my fan bias. No, no, no. Um, but it's Mo Salah, isn't it? So, it's like you've got him. God, you sound like as shout out, mate. I know. Uh, Jack Palmer owner. Yeah, I had him since. I'm just looking at. I've had him since game week 15. Um, and like you were saying, I think he, he's probably in the one where have I got a full strength team when there's some good fixtures. He's probably missed out for you know your likes of folders when they've had you know more difficult fixtures when he really shouldn't have done. Um, yeah, he's been he's been superb this season. Um, another one that you look at City and you go. You know, did should they really have let him go? But I think for him, it's been a great move. You know, like you said, he's become the talisman, and 
you know, he's a joy to watch and, you know, hopefully he's carries on the form for England into the summer sort of thing as well. So um, I'm torn between captaining him and um, Sonny because I've not got Salah. Um, but I mean, we've conceded, we've only had two clean sheets out of 29. So, you know, if, if Cole Palmer's that involved with with Chelsea's goals, which he is, um, it's very hard to sort of just, just look past him really, you know, regardless of value. Yeah, it almost feels like a blank would be a surprise. I don't mean that harshly, Jack. I mean from Palmer specifically. We we we're going to concede. It's you know it's it's just an inevitability. So um, yeah, it, it would like you said for for how involved he is, it would be very surprised to see him blank. The only reason I don't buy him this week, Gary, might be twofold. One, the midfield that I've got this week doesn't look too bad. I've got two Tottenham at home to Luton. We've got Foden at home to Arsenal, Bailey at home to Wolves. I'm currently bust with Jared Bowen on the bench away to a Newcastle team who give up a shitload of chances. Do I need to force Cole Palmer into that when the issues I have in my FPL team are defensively? Now, it's almost certain if I'm at a defensive transfer, Gary, I'm buying. Malo Gusto. That's the right move, isn't it? I'd say so. Um, I don't have him. Because of uh, run up until now, I knew it, it, it didn't look good as blanks. Because obviously we had to blank with the Carabao as well, and we have Man City away, so I got rid of him. And now it's like, well, now I quite want him, and it's nothing to do with our actual defense because our defense isn't that good. But he is so attacking, and he creates so many chances. Quite often he... we don't have someone who finishes the chances, but he's 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 got that potential. How safe is he? That's the, that's, the, that's the first question people want to know. And that normally ends with a Reese James part to the question as well. How safe is Gusto, in your opinion? Next few games, I think he's he's going to play. I know that we're going to be cautious with Reese, but I know that Reese wants to come back because, again, he wants to get an England squad. Now, I don't think he's going to get an England squad either, but I do think he's got more chance than Raheem Sterling. But he's shown that he got, like, it's not a revelation to say, is it? He can't be relied upon. And I'm pretty sure both times that he got injured this season, I don't even think he went down. I think he just knew. He's had so many injuries that it's like, I yeah, imagine so. Again. I've got to come off. I don't remember him going down at Everton. And I don't think he did at home to Liverpool, which were two games he got taken off. So the reality is Gusto is safe to start for a while. Whether that continues all the way till the end of the season, I don't know. Because it could be that Reese is available from the start of April and by the end of April, he's built up. But they will have to build him up. Yeah, and yeah. He's not going to be starting until probably no. sort of FA Cup semi-final at the earliest, I would guess. So that's sort anyway, of thing. And I don't think we could start him to just bring him back in a semi-final. No, no, no. Um, I mean, around about that time, though. It might be the midweek yeah. game afterwards, for example. Exactly. And that's that's what it would be. Like, especially if some... If, well. I was going to say somehow we've played City twice, we've drawn twice. If we went to extra time and Gusto has played 120 and Reese was available, you'd start him midweek. And with Reese as well, they've been really cautious with him. This isn't that we've roughed him back. He, he didn't start every week when he got injured and he didn't ever get to 90 minutes. In fact, most of the weeks he didn't even get near 90 minutes and he still got injured. So then, uh, there's there's two camps of there's two camps of Gusto interest. There's people like me who still have the wild card in pocket and are going well. Short term, it, I mean, Gusto might he might literally be one game and then I'm wild card. And I mean, I might the, the flip is I might end up wild card in subject to other doubles land now. And then there's, then that's a more awkward choice, isn't it? Because if I'm getting involved in Chelsea now, I'm looking, I'm going right, definite double thirty seven. Good fixtures from now till the end of the season. I mean, the hardest game in theory is Villa away in 35, in the sense that the Arsenal game will most likely form as part of a, a double, unless it lands in okay. 34, but then it, you could bench a Gusto Arsenal away. That doesn't particularly mm -hmm. matter anyway. So fixtures are good. You know there's another double going in there with a Brighton game somewhere. So your I think your your urge would be if you're wild carding now that you possibly want to go free Chelsea. Palmer's won. I don't know anybody would wildcard this minute and probably not get him in if it was this week. You want to go Gusto, but you also want it to last to the end. So put people's mind at ease if you can or tell them the truth, Gary. I think if, if you did go Gusto and wanted it to last to the end, you, you've probably actually got quite a good chance because 
Reese has just shown so many times now that he's he just can't do it. He just cannot stay fit. Maybe maybe it'll be different. Maybe he's had an operation and it's gonna be different. I don't I just don't think it is. Does... We don't know exactly when he's gonna be back at the moment. There'll probably be something that comes out in this time. What, this what about the returns of Cucurello and Chilwell, though? I realise they play on the other side of the pitch, but there are centre-backs you can play at right back, right? Uh, yeah, but none of them are anywhere near as good as Gusto. Right. I said, I, I'd put in the slack and quoted it on one of the things where I'd said, if he doesn't bring Gusto back in, he's a fucking idiot, Pochettino. Because I'd said, he's been our third best player. And he's a fucking now, idiot anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> but arguably now he's been our second best player. Obviously, Palmer's the best, and it's between Gallagher and Gusto as to who's been our next best player. I'm I'm going to um, ask Jack a Jack a question. Have you used your wild card, Jack? No, I've still got it. Are you nowish? You you don't know it. This is okay not to know. No, I, I'm I'm not using it now. I don't think. I think I'm going to save it. But okay, I've not, you... not got it set in stone. <laughs> but. When you if if you do and say say you do it with plans say bench boost thirty seven say you wildcard in thirty five Chelsea got double thirty five and it, and then thirty seven is there as part of a bench you're going to want to go free Chelsea I'm interested to know if you if you Jack had to go free Chelsea now who would be the third I mean I've got Gusto and Palmer um I struggle like I Gary dive in tell everyone. Depends when you're doing it. If you are doing it from beyond game week, I think 34, Jackson could be a shout. Once he's, because that'll be when he's past the point that he might get his ban for the other cards. So he's on nine at the moment. And we're a game behind everyone and two games behind some other teams. So our 32nd game, which is when the cutoff is, is actually in game week 34. And it's the midweek of game week 34. So that's quite a long time in terms of actual time. So he's probably going to get banned before then. But he is absolutely going to start. Even when Nkunku's back, I think Jackson, is the way that he's been playing recently, I think he's like pretty much a certainty. He's been doing all the things I was talking about in pre-season, where I was like, he's not necessarily going to be like the big goal scorer, but the off-the-ball work that he's going to do, and even like on the ball, but not towards the scoring goals kind of thing is going to be quite good. And that's, he was the one that set up Cucurella's goal at the weekend. Um, he's done that a, a couple of other times as well. Where he'll run like more out wide and we just need to get somebody in the box. So, um, and he generally has like quite a high XG. You know, he doesn't always take all of his chances, as we know. And he is still getting used to the league. And once again, he's one of those players that have played under 100 senior matches before the season started. Just because we paid a lot of money for him, actually we didn't pay that much, 30 so which to us isn't a lot. It doesn't mean that he's worth it. That's a five for you, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but so, so for me, it would probably be him, even though I also think that by the looks of things, Petrovic is going to stay as the league goalkeeper and Sanchez is probably going to be the cup goalkeeper. But why would you want to go for a Chelsea defensive that's a pure defensive? I've said that all season and I've not seen this look. With Jackson, Sorry to change my, change my mind. I want to come back onto the keepers, obviously. With, with Jackson, from 35, though, for example, you then have the threat of maybe in Kunku by that point, right? So that's a conversation for later that doesn't need to be made now. I realise he's on nine yellows. He hasn't actually been booked when he was on the pitch, as in playing, since Wolves away in December. I say you on the pitch playing because he got booked at Crystal Palace when he ran across the pitch as a substitute. But he hasn't been booked while he's been on the pitch since December. So he's been on the fringes of this for a long time. Does that not mean, if you were wildcarding now, does it not present an opportunity where you're wildcarding straight into Burnley, the Sheffield United next weekend, after Manchester United that he probably starts in the week anyway, and then there's Everton at home with 33 as well. It's an opportunity. You know what the risk is, but it's opportunity. Because most other people won't go there, right? There is an opportunity, and particularly we're going to have um, like Muniz as another striker who doesn't take up much cash. Jackson's not that expensive either, is he? I haven't, I haven't but you ain't benching money at Sheffield United this week. No, that's the only thing. No. Um, bench Palmer against this... Burnley instead. Maybe you could you could bench like Saka at City, couldn't you? This week. That's my plan. Yeah. I don't have Jackson, but my plan is to bench Saka at City. Yeah. Um, it is possible. But you know, but if he gets banned, it's a two-game ban as well. Yeah. I know. It's a sell. I get that. 
but it's risk it's risk and reward, isn't it? There's Burnley and Sheffield United in two of the next three. There's definitely worse that you could go if you were like, I need to have a little bit of a punt. I need I want to do something that nobody else is going to be doing. I think he's perfectly fine. And Kunku is again, it's just whether he's actually fit or not, he's not going to be match fit. We, we're not going to be able to get him match fit this season because it's just not going to have enough. Yeah, I know time. you said previously almost right off his season. I think yeah, you probably have much. to from a fantasy perspective anyway. You do because he's not going to get up to speed, is he? There's a difference between fitness and match fitness. And where are we going to give him the time to get the match fitness? It's like it's, I can't see it happening. And it's not as if when he's come in, he's been incredible where you're looking at him like, well, we have to get this guy back in as soon as he's fit. He's good. You can tell he's good. But you also don't look at it. Well, he's like build the attack around him sort of thing. And actually, I think we've been using him in the wrong way quite often anyway. Jack, for those who've got Burnley assets still from 29, what's the advice at this stage? Is it Kate, Bin? I mean, I, I can't imagine what assets you'd have. Really. I mean, would it be like a still Charlie Taylor, Taylor struggling around? But the, I suppose the, it matters, does it? The lack of clean sheets that we have is, you know, it's you're not really going to get much there. And, you know, I've been a... I, I like Charlie Taylor. I think he's a great player, but I think he's, you know, he's he's not really a fantasy football asset unless the clean sheets are there because he's attacking, he's attacking wise. It, it's, it's pretty poor. So, um, yeah, the, if if you've got, I guess they're not a, a hard sell with, 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 you know, if see how the form goes, but I don't, I, I wouldn't really advocate going for, for any Burnley assets at the moment. Um, you know, the one who maybe looks to be getting a bit of the points a minute is for Farner, but he's in a, obviously not eligible for the weekend. And then there's the return of Foster. So there's, there's question marks there, you know, because if, if Foster comes in at the weekend and scores two, you know, not saying that he will, but then, you know, that, that means that Fofana could drop out. Um, I wouldn't be opposed to us actually starting with both. I think, you know, we've, we've been playing Odebert in the number 10. We've, we've, you know, we've tried a few of the players there. It's not quite worked. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be opposed to see us, see us go more direct, but, We've not really seen that in start with two out and out forwards this season. So again, it's it's going to be a it's, it's a gamble either way. So yeah, <laughs> I can't really make much of a case if, at the minute. If you had to put a Burnley player in any position right now, where would you put your cash? I guess Vitinho is probably the probably the one at the minute. You know, out out of position, isn't he playing on the wing? Um, he played really well at the weekend. Um, but even before that, I was a little bit skeptical of him because he's he's had a couple of get a couple of games where you're going, but yeah, we're playing a right back in, 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 as a winger and he's not played great, so he's not quite shown the consistency of someone where you go, wow, yeah, I need to have him. Um, he probably would, he, he'd be all right as a you know sitting on your bench or or whatever, and if you needed him to drop in, then then he'd be all right. But yeah, I think he'd really be. Do doing... you think you'll stay in the team? I think so. Now, yeah, I think he, he he was probably man of the match, or if not up there at the weekend. Um, worked hard for the team and stuff as well. Um, so yeah, I, I think so. You'd never pick him over Gusto for FPL, though, would you? Surely. No, that's, that's the mean point. He's zero point yeah. two more than Gusto. Um, Taylor's four point zero. What do we know about Jordan Bayer? Is he ever going to be fit again? I don't know. He's he's. You know what companies like for giving stuff away and and the crap journalists have got in Burnley for actually getting stuff out of them. Um, he's been there and thereabouts for a while. Um, I'm not sure if he comes straight back in or whether we protect him as well. So, yeah, he's he's in a void for now. But ho- hopefully, we see him back by the end of the season. You know, he was he was phenomenal last season for us. Um, obviously, we, we all had a tough start, tough start to the campaign. So, uh, you know, it'd be nice to see him back. But you know, sort of putting him to the for the back of my mind at the minute, really, because we've you know we've got loads of other centre halves. Is O'Shea and Esteve like to stay first choice though? Do you think? Yeah, I would say so. Um, okay. The only player I can see dislodging that would be would be Bayer, um, and I think he would probably sit on the bench for a couple of weeks at least before he before he just came back in. Okay. Any love for Braun Larson at four point eight? We know he's on pens. You actually got one, Jack. Yeah, I know. 
I, d- I didn't even think he was going to take it, you know, because we know Josh... because we were following the chat in the Burnley Slack channel on Patreon yeah. last week where it was like, mm, we don't know. We never get one. Probably Fafana. <laughs> but even on the game, though, I thought Fafana hung, hung back and Cullen went up with it and held it. And I thought it okay. was the, you know, the Kieran Trippier thing that at, at Newcastle where he sort of shields him from it. Gary will tell you um, that's the Azpilicueta, by the way. Just, 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 yeah. <laughs> I got there first, Gary, that. right? Just, just back <laughs> off, back <laughs> off. <laughs> um, so I was surprised to see him get up and take it so um, yeah I mean I didn't think Brun last even had the, the greatest of game at the weekend I thought he, he slowed things down so much he played on the left you know we were crying out for someone on the left that you know can actually take a man on or can bloody kick it with the left foot for Christ's sake um, so yeah I, with the amount of wingers we've got I, I would not be tempted to go there um, yeah can we just say, Gary, as Pilaqueta, that's not kidding anyone, isn't it? Like trips, I get it. As Pilaqueta, that's not kidding anyone, was it? Um, no, but it doesn't necessarily have to kid anyone because they didn't know who was going to take the penalty. Now they knew yeah. it probably wasn't going to be as Pilaqueta, but also we were. I, I can't even remember which South American team we were playing. I want to say Corinthians, but I don't know. Um, so it's a World Cup Cup final anyway. Um, and they're notorious for getting in the players' faces and whatever. So all you need is your actual penalty taker to walk off. And Gary, it's fine. do not ever claim that Club World Cup to me again when you don't even know you played in the final, mate. Right. Back in your box. Keepers. I've never claimed it. I've never claimed it. it. Sit down. Don't go Mourinho on me, honestly. Uh, <laughs> Petrovic Sanchez, what's going on? Um i point out, by the way, that Mourinho's never won the Club World Cup, so he's in my camp, actually, on this. Um, <laughs> he never I'm will, either. Pretty, sh- <laughs> <laughs> pretty sure that Petrovic is the number one, and we're going to play our number one in the league, and we're going to play our number two, which is Sanchez, in the cup. And I think he deserves to play, personally, and it's not actually a popular view among Chelsea fans. A lot of Chelsea fans don't like him. Um, Sorry, which one to clarify? Sorry, it's Sanchez. A lot of Chelsea fans don't like Sanchez. Uh, he is so relaxed when the ball comes to him and not in the good Cole Palmer way. This is in the bad. Do you not realise there's a player steaming at you and you're going to concede a goal? Um, Came from Brighton. What do you expect? So this is the other thing, though. We don't like this Brightonification of Chelsea either. And that counts against players. So that has started counting against people like Sanchez. Like Kukulina. But this good Scottish lad in midfield, have you seen him play? Billy Gilmore. <laughs> so, yeah. Look, I I think that Sanchez is a good goalkeeper, but I've said to you in the past, his kicking is like atrocious. Like You wouldn't actually believe how bad his kicking is. I also think he's quite weak on set pieces. And Petrovic is a little bit better with his kicking. He's probably a little bit better with set pieces. And... In terms of like actual goalkeeping, there's not that much between them. People will tell you that Petrovic is far better. He's not, not as a goalkeeper, not as an actual goalkeeper. They're both like actually quite good. But I do think Petrovic is probably the number one and probably deserves to be the number one as well. I'm just not unhappy when Sanchez starts in the cup game like a lot of other Chelsea fans are. But that's just yeah. two clean sheets in his 11 games so far, which Sheffield United at home and Fulham at home. Um, there will be a temptation, and people keep asking this. One is is 4.5. Eats them doubles again, right? If you if you can get the keeper that doubles, and we know that Brighton-Chelsea game is likely to go in an odd week, and we can't go for the Brighton goalkeeper, can we? God knows who that's going to be in goal at the time. Yeah. So th- that's yeah. why people just keep coming back to... Because people want a third Chelsea, and that part of that is, if I can get the goalkeeper, that will do me. I can bench it when I don't want it. I'll play it when I do want it. You think Petrovic? I think Petrovic is going to start the rest of the league games. Um, I did wonder if there's a possibility that he switches it around and says, actually, now we're in a cup semi-final and Petrovic will start the cup semi-final, which would probably come from us losing like three of our next four league games. Goes, right, what, league what you're saying time. is if the league season goes tits up and there's nothing yeah. to play for in the league, That's right. then you exactly. think he might go Petrovic in the semi-final as Sanchez finishes the season. That is the risk. That is, okay. in my opinion. And that will depend on the next, how many games is it? Four is next 30, 30 to 33 and then the semi-finals in 34. So yeah, the next four I find matches. It, I mean, 
you're capable, Gary, but with those four fixtures, I fail to see how your league season could be over at the end of it. I'm saying nothing, mate. I'm not having Nico <laughs> clip whatever I'm about to say in regards to my next four games. Can't be in a position after those next four fixtures where you're you're going, well, we can't even finish eighth. That can't be possible, mate. No, uh, but it depends on... Winning some games of football. Well. I get that. But no, but also it's like if he goes, okay, well, we're now 12th, but we can come eighth, he might go, but I've only got a big city and then... We're in the cup final, and then I've got a much better chance. So I, I, I don't know. Yeah, I've just, I, I'd like and only beat City. Only, exactly, <laughs> only beat City. But you know what I mean? There's only one game. That's, he's like, you why, must have got them two performances against Manchester City this season. That must be the biggest frustration of your whole season, mate. Two brilliant performances. Why? Why is that frustrating? Because it shows what the team's capable of, mate. I get that. Um, so yeah, so we're we're unbeaten against Man City, and then we've done we did well against Liverpool, we did well against Arsenal, and we've now gone to Aston Villa and we've won. And you obviously did well against my team before the red cards. That's right, and, and obviously we will say that that we were battered for fifteen minutes, and then we did get ourselves back into it and did look like equalising, yep. which we did, and then obviously then went um, how it went. But yeah, there's there's something behind this team, but I just know that they've also got the other side and I knew that that was going to be the case at, at the start and it's like no it doesn't frustrate me it gives me hope and like things yeah okay good there is some promise and it does show again as I said that this team wants to play for this manager whether it's like whether he's still going to be the manager in two or three years I don't know but I think he should still be the manager next season because I think yeah. these guys are buying into what he's doing and I think he's he is doing the right things for the like level that we're actually at. I, I, I suspect we'll have the, the Chelsea transfer conversation again before we get to transfer window opening, my friend. Uh, Jack, why did Mirich suddenly come back in goal at the weekend? I have no idea. Um, I mean, it's been a big talking point amongst most Burnley fans this season. Um, I think, you know, my take on it was that I thought Mirich should have started the season. It was his shirt to, to lose. Um, it just seems like one of company's experiments again, you know, that he was just being, you know, Gary talked to before about a stubborn manager. I think we've got exactly the same here. Um, there was rumours going around that um, Trafford had a clause in his contract that meant that if he's fit, he had to play every game, which I didn't even know if that was something that was possible, but, you know, there was, there was rumours going around about that. Um, and then just last week, company's done an interview where he's saying, I will be proven right about Trafford. You know, he's, he's a great goalkeeper. Um, so we thought, you know, the, it's it's got a bit toxic as well, really, amongst the fan base, because every time that Trafford's made a mistake, you'll hear shouts from of Murich from the fan base. Um, Murich uh, Trafford dropped a clangor against Palace. He starts the next week, you know, he has a relatively good game, and then, you know, and and then he comes in for this weekend. It just made it made no sense. Mm. Um, but I think the team is much better off for having Murich in in there. To be honest, I think. Um, you know, it just it just felt so much calmer at the back. It was just with the way he started attacks and how how quick he was. Um, you know, his passing range is just phenomenal. I think he's. Well, I'm not lying by saying I think he's our best passer of the ball. Um, you know, and he's in there. It's like why we're we playing a left back in there. He's just ridiculous. Don't tell um, Gary. Be buying him, mate. Yeah, <laughs> but I, I just I just don't. It's another one of this season's you know, sort of experiments that I, I just don't get it. He was someone who was in the championship goalkeeper of the season last season. He's, you know, he's he's all right at shot stopping. You know, he's, he's, he's all round goalkeeping. He's good enough, I thought, but his, his other bits of stuff, you know, playing out from the back and, you know, distribution was absolutely superb. And we've seen to transition from last season of having a really fluid, you know, sort of defence. And, you know, we had obviously Ian Matson on loan from Chelsea, who I was you know, a massive fan of, that we've then not got in and got and not replaced him and we're playing with a really rigid Charlie Taylor at the back, which is fine if you're going to play that style of football, but we, we've still tried to play last season style of football um, and it's just really hurt us, but no, it's really good to see Murich back in, but obviously that's now at the, you know, at the mercy of, of, of Trafford losing out, which I feel sorry for him and it's become more of a story than it needed to be really. Do you think it could have had anything to do with the England squad? 
Not sure. And he wasn't um, in it. I.e. He was just leaving a door open in case maybe he got the call up as the third keeper. Potentially. Um I did hear another rumor at the weekend from you know a group of mates who you know you know you, you get the ones that talk a lot of nonsense and th- these ones aren't that that apparently there was um, some scouts from a, a top three side down looking at Trafford and apparently it's almost a done deal that he's signing for one of those which it sounded a bit nonsense to me but the only one I could think of would maybe be Arsenal if they were letting Ramsdale Replace go. Replace Ramsdale. Yeah, but I don't know why that would then be that he he doesn't play so and unless it really is we need to make sure he doesn't get injured or something. But uh... it's, Possibly, it's a stretch. Possibly, I mean, I presume he wouldn't be going back to City. That would seem strange yeah. at this juncture. They Liverpool, can execute maybe, their maybe buyback if, clause if they want. I mean, I guess the, the run Keller is having, there'll be a few looking at him to be their number one next year, maybe. So possibly Liverpool as well, maybe. But I mean, they've not even really got a manager signed up for next year. So it seems it seems a, seems a stretch for me. But as, as far as we know, neither Pochettino or Vincent Company have been approached for the Liverpool job as it stands. Uh, gents, thank you both very much. Uh, Gary, correct score prediction for... It is Saturday. Is it Saturday 3 o'clock, isn't it? I think so. It is Saturday 3pm. Go on yeah. in, mate. I think we'll win by two. So I'm going to go with a 3-1. So don't trust us to keep thinking. So Malagusto's not worth the minus four then. So I'm actually tempted by him for a minus four because he's still got that potential for attacking. Even if we don't keep it. And I might be wrong. We might keep a clean sheet in a game that we should keep a clean sheet in for once. Jack? It's got two clean sheets written over, hasn't it? No, I can't go nil nil. Um <laughs> You can't <I> was... <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna go and say two one to us. Um Good lad. Just, just being positive, just because I think you know what, it'd be so us to go there and, and win, but then cock up the rest of the season still. So so we started this podcast with Gary telling us Burnley will win, and now we're ending it with Jack telling us that Burnley will win. Uh, can't see you not winning, uh, to be honest, Gary. I, I I can't see you staying up from here, Jack, but if enough teams keep getting points deductions, it's remarkable that you, you're still within touching distance. There are definitely some winnable games there, mate. Definitely. Um, and to be fair, Gary, as well, at, with the fixtures you've got left, I know what you're going to say, but you, you should find yourself a European place there, really, I think, even from 11th. Yeah, I think we should. But I'm glad that you finally stopped asking me about if we're going to come top four or not. Because at least we know for definite that we're not. So. Which which reminds me of the last question I did want to ask you. Top five? <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't, I, I can't see. We, we, we don't have the consistency to, to get ourselves into the top five. I'd absolutely love it, obviously. I would love us to qualify for Europe. I'm not like one of those, oh, they want the conference league because of whatever. But no, whatever it is. I got an email today from uh, hotels.com saying that all of my rewards have expired because I haven't used it for a year. Well, why is that? Because we went out of the Champions League just over a year ago. So, that's, yeah. That's no, get us back in the Champions League. Get me some reward points on hotels.com again. Yeah. It's even funnier if you knew what Gary did for a living. On that bombshell, uh, we'll leave it there. Thank you both so much. Uh, good luck in game week 30 and for the rest of the season. So you'll be back with me with the Sky Fantasy Football Podcast tomorrow. Next week's Clash of Correspondence, I can tell you, is Nottingham Forest versus Crystal Palace with Mark Southerns and Rory McLaughlin. Now, that'll be Wednesday or Thursday next week, but to be confirmed. Uh, thanks very much, Gary and Jack. Cue music, please. Manchild. 